Good afternoon. My name is Hallie Leinhart, Outreach Specialist for the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Financial Education and Account Access Among Elementary Students, co-hosted today by CFED and CFS. Our presenters today are Louisa Quitman, Director of Financial Education in the Office of Consumer Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, Casey Wiedrich, Senior Research Manager at CFED, Jennifer McHugh, Community Relations Manager at Royal Credit Union, Laura Rosen, Opportunity Texas Coordinator at the Center for Public Policy, Priorities, and Elizabeth Otters White, who is joining us live in Madison, She's an associate professor at the Wisconsin School of Business and a CFS affiliate. Just a reminder before we get started with the presentations, to submit questions to be answered in the question and answer portion that will take place in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar, please click on the Ask a Question icon in the bottom right corner of your screen and submit your question. And with that, I will turn it over to Louisa. Thank you. Treasury commissioned the research that you'll hear about today to examine the combined impact of classroom financial education and the presence of a bank or credit union branch in school to building the financial knowledge and capability of young students. There's been a lot of discussion about both financial education in the classroom and children's savings, but less evidence of the impact. And we were pleased to be able to identify projects that could conduct a thorough assessment of outcomes. The findings of this rigorous research project provide some very important insights for policy as well as for practice. My colleagues later on the call will discuss from a practice standpoint. The Treasury Department is considering the findings, and we will be sharing them widely with other federal agencies, including those that work with financial institutions and the financial industry, and those that support education and programs for children and youth. Through our Interagency Financial Literacy and Education Commission, we are working with federal agencies to better coordinate activities that build the financial capability of more Americans, and we are looking to do so in ways that are effective and sustainable. This model certainly holds promise in both regards. We also will be sharing this research with the new President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability for Young Americans. This body, appointed by President Obama, will identify leading approaches to the President and the Administration. We will also hold up models for replication in communities around the country and by the private sector. Educators, state and local policymakers, financial institutions, and youth-serving organizations may all draw useful insights from this research. Various sectors have an interest and a role to play in helping more children get an early start in understanding basic financial concepts and building financial habits and confidence in, in their ability to control their financial lives. There is evidence that this early education and hands-on learning will stay with young people as they move into adulthood and help them manage more complex financial choices that they will have to make, including choices about financing higher education. We are very pleased that we have findings of this work to share with you, and it would not have been possible without the excellent hard work of the team led by CFED with huge contributions by the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Opportunity Texas, and the local school districts, financial institutions, teachers, and other partners. It has been a pleasure in working with this team in every regard. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Casey Weidert. Thanks, Louisa. Again, this is Casey Weidert from CFD. And first, just say thanks to Louisa and her team for all the support in this work as well. Um, and as Louisa touched on in her remarks, what we were really looking at here was, you know, trying to understand how can we provide children with the financial skills that they'll need to become economically successful? How do we really build their financial capability? And we were interested in focusing on younger students, those in elementary school. As much of the research on financial education to date has focused on high school students, and the results have been somewhat mixed, which, you know, sort of suggests to many of us that we should think about working with younger students, you know, in the hopes of instilling knowledge and behavior at a younger age when kids are first just sort of learning about money and how they might manage. You know, in, in thinking about how to instill these skills, we were interested in looking beyond just financial education, but wanted to combine it with financial access, and in this case, access to accounts, you know, as a way to really provide students with hands-on experience and opportunities to directly apply the lessons they're learning. And we wanted to make the education more experiential, as this has been shown, that this can really help some students learn a lot better and help those lessons kind of sink in. Um, and the, the last point in this is just that 
we were also interested in doing a really rigorous research on these topics, one, because we hadn't seen any research before on combining access with education, and we also wanted to provide evidence to those in the field, practitioners or policymakers that are really interested in these lessons and wanting to know what they should do next about them. So if we move on to the next slide, so what we're looking at in the AFCO pilot is two pilots that we conducted that consisted of classroom-based financial education and access to in-school banking programs, and we did this in two communities between 2011 and 2013. So in the first year of the pilot, we worked in the fourth and fifth grade classrooms in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is a small city on the western side of Wisconsin, um, and we chose Eau Claire primarily because they had a very long-standing and successful partnership with the local credit union, Rail Credit Union, who's on the phone with us today, um, providing in-school branches in the elementary schools. And then the second year of the pilot, we replicated the study in Amarillo, Texas, which, again, is the smaller community sort of in the panhandle or smaller city in Texas in the panhandle region. Um, and we moved into the second site both um, as it was a slightly larger school district. We wanted to really um, build up the sample size of students in the study, but also to implement the pilot in a slightly more diverse context, um, you know, sort of looking at some of the numbers there that are on the slide, you know, compare 41% of students in Eau Claire are economically disadvantaged, which means they qualify for free, reduced price lunch. Um, and you compare that to almost 70% of the students in Amarillo and also um, 80% of the students in Eau Claire were white versus only about 40% of students in Amarillo were white. Um, Amarillo also had an active in-school bank program with Happy State Bank, which we'll provide a few more details in the morning. And Texas also provided another opportunity um, as they had passed some financial education standards um, for the K-12 through curriculum, but they had yet to be implemented. So this is a really interesting time where we could look at the standards that have been put into state law, but before school districts actually had to implement them. Um, so it sort of gave us a neat window of time to sort of get feedback and test those standards. So if you go to the next slide, we can see that there are a number of partners involved in the study, most of whom are represented on the webinar today. So the funding was provided by the U.S. Treasury Department, and the project and the research were really led by CFED and CFS. And we worked with a number of partners to implement these projects on the ground. And as Louisa did, I also want to take another moment to really say thank you to all of these partners on the ground. Without their hard work and flexibility and dedication, we really wouldn't have been able to get these um, off the ground in the timeline that we did, and, and the results wouldn't be as successful as they are. So thank you to all of you who helped make this possible. And in Eau Claire, that was the Eau Claire School District as well as Royal Credit in Amarillo, Opportunity Texas really read, led the implementation. Texas Council for Economic Education helped us um, with the curriculum and also training the teachers. The Amarillo Independent School District and Happy State Bank were our partners on the ground there as well. So moving on to the next slide, you know, the research question we were interested in answering was, what is the impact of this classroom-based financial education and access to in-school accounts? both alone and in combination on students' financial knowledge, their attitudes towards things such as savings, financial institutions, as well as their financial behavior, which we we're looking at in this study, is opening accounts and using those accounts. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to start to walk you through some of the elements of the pilot and the research design, starting with the financial education. So students in this pilot received five or six lessons financial education during their regular class time once a week during the study period. The curriculum we used was adapted from the Council on Economic Education's Financial Fitness for Life curriculum, and the lessons we chose were focused on concepts related to using a savings account. So we talked about different savings options and what is interest. Um, you're talking about goal setting, those types of things. And in, the t in Texas, because, again, Texas had set standards um, that we wanted to make sure our curriculum fit into those standards. The Texas Council for Economic Education made a few adjustments from what we um, implemented in Eau Claire just to make sure that we met the standards for the fourth grade in Texas. 
All the lessons were about 45 minutes, and in almost all cases, the lessons were taught by the regular classroom teachers. Both to standardize the lessons as well as to help teachers feel prepared, we provided training on the curriculum for all teachers. The training lasted for about three hours to a full day of training in Texas. Um, and, you know, in addition to training on the curriculum, we also provided teachers with a little bit of lessons for themselves sort of on financial education so they felt comfortable with the concept. And we also provided copies of all the materials and lessons you know, in an effort to really try to minimize the amount of prep work that teachers had to do for this pilot. So moving on to the next slide, um, the next presenter is going to provide you with more detail on the in-school banking program, so I just want to walk you through the research design for a second. So in the first year of the pilot, again, we were working in the fourth and fifth grade classrooms in all of Eau Claire's 13 elementary schools. And the project was implemented during the, the spring semester. So towards the beginning of the semester, all fourth and fifth grade students took a baseline survey or assessment. They took it during class. And that assessment measured financial knowledge, attitudes, behavior. And then we randomly assigned students at the classroom level to receive financial education during the pilot or during the treatment period. And about 50% of students received financial education for again about five weeks during this study. Um, and in Eau Claire, about half the schools, the 13 of, or six of the 13 schools, had access to in-school programs through RCU, through their school sense program. Um, you know, and sort of RCU operating in half of the schools, even prior to AFCO coming in, really created kind of a natural comparison group. So we didn't make any adjustments to that program's normal operating procedures during the pilot. Um, but what this design allowed us to have was sort of four comparison groups. And so we had a group of students that got the financial education and had access to their bank accounts in schools. There's some students that got financial education didn't have access in schools. Some students had access to accounts that didn't have financial education. And then we had a group that had no financial education during the study period and didn't have access to accounts. And then following the financial education lessons, um, all of the students, again, took that same assessment. So we had pre and post data on the students' knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. And then finally, because the school district felt it was so important um, that all students receive the financial education lessons, the, the control group got the lessons after the study was over, so after the students had taken the second assessment. If we move to the next slide, talk a little bit about what happened in the second year of the pilot. Um, and as you can see from the slide, we largely used the same um, research design, trying to keep things the same as they were in the first year of the pilot with a few changes, which I'll discuss in a second. Um, so again, in Eau Claire, we're working in just the fourth grade classrooms this time because the students who were now fifth graders had participated in the previous year when they were fourth graders. Um, and again, all students took the assessment randomly assigned half of them to financial education. After the education, took this assessment a second time. But we used the opportunity of being in Eau Claire for two years to follow up with those students who were now fifth graders who had participated previously. So we gave those students the assessment for a third time, and that was roughly about a year after students had taken it um, during the first year of the pilot. The, the second difference I want to touch on is about the bank and school programs in Amarillo. So again, as I said, Amarillo had a really strong bank and school program operating in some of the schools. The difference in Amarillo was that there are 36 elementary schools in Amarillo. Happy State Bank was working at only three of them prior to the AFCO pilot. And we wanted to create a much larger comparison group of students who had access to accounts. So Happy State Bank and the Amarillo School District agreed to, you know, sort of greatly expand that program um, and also allowed us to randomly select the schools that that program would expand. So we randomly selected an additional 15 schools in the school district to work with Happy State Bank in the in-school banking program. So we had a total of 18 schools with in-school banking program there. And if we move to the next slide, so, you know, in the, the difference there, um, 
between Eau Claire, where, again, that was a longstanding program of students that had sort of long-term access to these accounts, we were rolling out new in-school banking programs in 15 of these schools. The majority of the kids really hadn't had access to these accounts before. So in an interest to sort of boost participation rates, we decided to offer students an incentive to open accounts. And how we did this was um, Opportunity Texas used some privately raised dollars to offer a $25 incentive um, to about half of the students in the schools that had access to the banking program. Um, and the way that we did this was we held a drawing in the classroom um, but the teacher sort of drew names out of a hat of students who would receive the $25 incentive, and they got sort of a certificate, and you can see an example on the slide there in front of you, that if they turned that certificate in with their paperwork to open the account, they would get $25 deposited into their account. And again, we were trying to both sort of raise the participation of students in this program as well as it, we took it as an opportunity to see what is the impact of offering an incentive, like does it help kids get into the program. Um, so that was a pretty quick and big overview, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to give you more detail about their full sense program. Thank you. I'm Jennifer Block McHugh, Community Relations Manager at Royal Credit Union. I also serve on the Governor's Council on Financial Literacy here in Wisconsin. Our credit union serves over 150,000 members and covers 18 counties in northwest Wisconsin and 12 in the Twin Cities metro in Minnesota. First, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Royal Credit Union School Sense program. School Sense was established in 1993. A mother of an elementary student in Eau Claire read an article in Good Housekeeping magazine about a Save It School program and wanted to bring one to our community. The principal contacted Royal Credit Union, and the rest is history. Today we have 27 school site locations. We are in 17 elementary schools, five middle schools, and five high schools. We have six staff members who work exclusively for this program. Two of us are full-time, and four are part-time at varying our levels. This is the core team, and we run the majority of our schools. Our credit union does have a large footprint, so we do have some schools that are over an hour away from our corporate location. So in these instances, we have RCU branch staff in those communities work in the schools. As far as the students, we quote unquote hire about 350 students each year. And last year, those students processed over 17,000 transactions. To give you a better sense of how the program operates, let's watch the first two minutes of this video we produced. And I'm Taryn. Ever wonder how to save your money? It's fun. Yeah, how to make your money grow so you can get the things you really want? You can save here, but there's another place just for us. Here's a hint. You go there almost every day. Come on, we'll show you. You guessed it, at school. Where else would you go to learn about important stuff? Let's check it out. Get it? Like, write a check? You won't be writing any checks here, but here's where you can save at school. Let's find out how it works and how it can be fun. First of all, the school savings program is called School Sense, and RCU, our very own credit union, makes it all happen. Don't forget that students get to help too. Right. Not only do students get to learn how to save their own money, but they can work just like regular RCU employees and help other students in their school save too. Okay, show them what we do. First, we'll start with the savings part. Our few school sense savings programs are found at several schools in the area, including elementary schools, middle school, or a high school. The cool staff from RCU shows up at the schools once a week, and they help take care of everything. What do the students do? They sign up to save, silly. Of course, you have to have some money to start saving with. Then you and your parents fill out a simple application. Let the saving begin. Tell me more. Well, you get all this cool stuff to help you save. You get a Super Saver pouch, which you bring your money in each week. And you get a Super Saver card that is stamped every time you make a deposit. So, what's the stamp for? For every four stamps, you get to pick a prize. You are saving your very own money and getting prizes to do it. How cool is that? Awesome. I'm saving at school every week. But we have to tell everyone about the job part. You know, working for school sense like a real RCU employee. 
Yeah, whether you're at an elementary school, a middle school, or a high school, it's just like applying for a real job. But you have to get permission from your parents first, right? Yes, and if you're hired, you get a t-shirt and a name tag. And who knows, maybe you can work at a regular RCU office someday. And that's just a portion of that video. It goes on for a couple more minutes, and we had so much fun making it. While we do have a large program, the study just included our Eau Claire Elementary School sites. As was mentioned earlier, at the time of the study, we had branches in six of the 13 elementary schools in the district. As for the account type, the child is the primary owner, the parent or guardian is joined. For students joining the school site program, our CU deposits the $5 we require to open a savings account. As you saw in our video, our elementary sites are open once a week during the school day. The kids are very hands-on and actually run the show when the branch is open, of course, under the careful supervision of our adult financial education representatives. Let's move on to the next slide. I wanted to share with you why we wanted to participate in the study, and it really was for three main reasons. First, this was a great opportunity for us to be part of bringing financial education into the classroom. The fact that every single child in the Eau Claire Area School District was going to receive the curriculum as part of this study was very exciting. As was previously mentioned, we went in after the study and gave the lessons to the children in the control group. Another reason why we wanted to participate was for the facts. As the manager of a financial school site program, I knew the importance of this research. It's an investment for financial institutions to operate Save at School programs. The picture on this slide is shown from last fall. It was the ribbon cutting for our 27th site. Our hope was that the research would show that these programs, coupled with in-classroom education, help children become more financially literate. Each time I ask to open a new site, I first need to gain approval from our executive team and our board of directors. Now, they've obviously been wonderfully supportive, but imagine how much stronger our proposals would be if we had research to prove these programs work. And finally, this was a wonderful opportunity for staff development. We had over 20 people at our credit union who took part in some way over the course of the two-year study, compliance, IT, marketing, and, of course, our education team. We hosted the curriculum training for the study at our corporate center, and several of our staff were able to take part because some teachers in the district chose to have our CU educators come in and teach the lesson. And we can move on to uh, my final slide. Uh, I was able to participate as an RCU volunteer educator for the study. Coming up shortly, Elizabeth is going to walk you through all of their official findings, but right now I want to share with you an anecdote. One of the fourth grade classes I taught sent me thank you cards. You can see a couple of them on the screen, and my last name was actually Block at the time. But what I really loved about the curriculum is that each student chose something to save for, and we taught them how to make a plan that would allow the student to accomplish a short-term savings goal. Madeline was into 4-H, and she was saving for a calf. Brennan, though he didn't say it on his note, was saving for fencing equipment, a hobby he enjoyed with his dad. The connections we made with these children in the classroom were real, and it was powerful to witness their financial awareness grow. The students were so excited to tell me about their progress each week. Many would tell me that they talked about their savings plan with their mom or dad or grown up at home. It was a very meaningful process for all of us, and we were very proud to take part in the research. And now I would like to introduce Laura Rosen. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. My portion of the presentation will be focused on the Amarillo Field Study, which I was involved with. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Happy State Bank, Kids Bank Program. They also offer a joint ownership savings account and did so for the study. However, some parents couldn't provide the forms of identification HAPI required to open an account, and so they also, or just for this program, allowed students to open minor-only accounts, which the student wholly owns and only requires the student's signature to open. Kids think days with their program are typically every two to three re weeks, but for the study, they were once a week. In their program, the Kids Bank only allows students to make deposits on bank day, which encourages savings. Typically, they have, like a Royal Credit Union, have student staff the Kids Bank, which Happy believes is an important component of the program because it more deeply engages students in the program. Next slide. 
Now I'm going to share some qualitative findings and outputs from the Amarillo field study before Elizabeth shares the quantitative research findings. I'm sharing qualitative findings just from the Amarillo field study because I oversaw this component of the project and observed the implementation there. These findings are also documented in a brief we wrote about the Amarillo field study's implementation, which can be downloaded from the Opportunity Texas webpage, which is included at the end of this presentation. As you can see, on this slide, we list the participation rate in Amarillo. Uh, nearly 40% of students in schools with kids' banks opened an account. And we found that students that were offered the $25 seed deposit, which Casey talked about, opened accounts at higher rates. 43% um, of those that received the seed deposit versus 32% of those students that did not weren't offered it. One output we were pleased to see, Casey mentioned Happy State Bank had to roll out 15 new kids' bank programs. And at the end of the study, each school was given the option of continuing the kids' bank or stopping it. 15 of the 18 schools that had kids' banks after the study period, decided to continue them the next school year. We think this shows that the school administration felt that the program added value to their students' learning experience. Next slide. We saw a lot of variation in account take up by school. As you can see here, it ranged from 20% to 60%. We saw that school administration played a key role in, di in driving account take up. We did find that, on average, schools with more economically disadvantaged students had the same or higher take-up than schools with fewer economically disadvantaged students. And it's worth noting, and Casey mentioned as well, that um, the Amarillo School District has uh, nearly 70% of its students are economically disadvantaged, meaning they qualify for free or reduced price lunch. And in Texas, that's higher than our state average. We initially got some um, pushback from some of the schools. Schools um, were told that they needed to roll out the in-school banking program, and they were randomly assigned this program. And I received calls, and some of the schools with more higher rates of economically disadvantaged students initially were not very receptive to the program. They felt that it wouldn't work in their school because their students and their families didn't have money to save. It was interesting to observe that by the end of the study's implementation, two of the three schools that um, were concerned about how the program would work in their schools ended up having some of the highest participation rates. And these schools' principals ended up kind of embracing the program towards the end of it. I asked one of these school principals, you know, what she was observing in her schools. And she said that um, in her school, the bank time was during the after-school hours, and she said some of her parents would line up with their kids to make deposits and seem proud that their children had this program in their school. Next slide. Now I'd like to share some successful practices to operating an in-school banking program that we observed during the study's implementation. We found that the amount of marketing the school did about the program was key to the school's kids' bank participation rate and that campus administration and staff really drove the school's marketing efforts. Happy State Bank provided each school with a list of marketing ideas and resources to market their programs. They have posters that schools can hang up, which you can see on the slide there. Um, they also have yard signs that they encourage schools to put out the day before bank day, the day of bank day, which you can see on the slide as well, and they offer a variety of ideas for how schools can market the program. However, ultimately, the school administration has to implement these strategies. And it appeared that those schools where leadership dedicated time to marketing had higher participation rates in the program. We also observed that it was helpful to have the school district market the program to families. We heard that in Amarillo that families have a lot of trust in their child's school and rely on it for a variety of information and resources and that families would be much more likely to participate if the school endorsed the program. For, our, for both of our pilots, we sent a brochure home with students letting them know about the study, and the brochure presented the curriculum and the banking program to parents and students as one program, which we think also encouraged parents to open accounts for their students. 
parents felt that combine or presenting these as one program, that the program was connected to their students' learning, which we think made them more likely to open an account. And finally, um, we found that it's important to offer accounts that meet the needs of all families and to make sure all families are able to meet the account opening requirements. Next slide. We collected teacher feedback about the lessons and program after each lesson. And teachers, near, generally, nearly all had positive feedback about both the lessons and about the Kids Bank. Some teachers reported that their students' participation in the Kids Bank brought concepts they taught to life. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Elizabeth Otters-White, who will talk about the study's results. Thank you, Laura. And thanks to everybody who has spoken thus far. I think you guys have all done a great job of setting up the program design, the research design, as well as the implementation. So I'll just jump right into a discussion of the results. Let me start by talking about the data. Um, as Casey said, we did both pre- and post-surveys and collected a number of different pieces of information from students on those surveys. The first thing that we gathered is information on their financial knowledge. Financial knowledge was determined based on a quiz score. The quiz had 13 questions. The questions were taken from Financial um, Fitness for Life, which was the curriculum, as Casey mentioned, that we modified for the program. And they were multiple choice questions that were primarily either definitional or simple calculations. So something like um, the money that you receive for depositing your cash in the bank is called. Or um, I have $50 in my checking account, I deposit $20, I withdraw 10, what is the balance in my checking account? So, 13 questions there, one point each for a total uh, score possible of 13. As Casey and Louisa both indicated, though, we're not only interested in students' knowledge. While that's a piece of it, we really care about their capability or their skills. And as you can imagine, this can be difficult to measure with, with younger students, but we have some abilities to do that in two ways here. One is looking at their behaviors, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the other is trying to get some sense of their attitudes, because we certainly imagine that there's a connection between attitudes and behaviors. So we asked students questions about spending money, for example, how difficult it was for them to avoid spending money immediately, how easy it was for them to save money. And all of these attitude questions were on five-point scales, where they indicated how strongly they agreed or disagreed with a statement. There were also attitude questions that dealt with whether or not they thought they belonged in, in, in banking. Um, is it just for adults? Is saving just for adults? Are banks useful to you? And then as I mentioned a minute ago, we also looked at their banking activity. So we could look at whether or not the student had their own bank account, as well as the net deposits that they made and the amount of activity they had in the account. So just a couple words on the sample size before I delve more deeply into the results. There were many, many students touched by this program that do not show up in our final sample um, that I have represented here because of consent. So there were probably between a 30 and 40 percent consent rate, both in Eau Claire and Amarillo, because when we're doing human subjects research like this, we of course need consent from the parents as well as assent from the students. So our final sample here for the study itself contains about 1,400 students, split pretty evenly between Eau Claire and Amarillo, and then again split pretty evenly between the control group that did not receive the financial education during the study period and the treatment group that did receive it. But again, I want to emphasize that the reach of the program was actually much larger because we, we worked with many, many students throughout the program. Um, so just a quick preview of the results in case I run out of time and don't uh, get to all of them in detail. We saw large positive effects of financial education on knowledge. Um, perhaps not surprising, but we haven't seen a lot of rigorous studies with, with children of this age. So this is very promising and encouraging. Um, we also see effects of in-school banking and education on attitudes, um, how they feel about banks, whether they think saving is for them. Education and bank account uh, access boost bank account ownership by kids. And this is an important piece that I'll talk about in more detail in a minute. And finally, maybe most important, we see that the effects persist. So Casey mentioned that the Eau Claire pilot went on for two years and that we looked at the fourth graders from the first year a year later as fifth graders, and we saw that many of the knowledge gains and the attitude improvements 
uh, persisted one year after the program. So let me just dive in a little bit deeper here into um, some of the particular results. So first, looking at knowledge, we have two panels here, both relate to financial quiz scores. If you look at the left-hand panel, the gold line indicates the effect of financial education, and then the blue line is for those students in the control group that did not receive the financial education. And of course, we have the baseline and then the follow-up period. And you can see that this illustrates a very strong positive increase uh, in the knowledge or the quiz scores um, for the students who received the education. As I said, these are scored out of 13 points, and we're looking at about a two-point increase for those who got the education. If you look at the right-hand panel, it doesn't look like um, it mattered a lot in terms of the education whether or not students had a bank branch in their school or not. We saw gains with both. The one statement that I will make about bank account access is, if you look at the second bullet point on the slide, we did see that students with bank account ownership, so not just a bank in their school, but with bank accounts themselves, did have slightly stronger effects in terms of knowledge gains, but we need to be a little careful about how we interpret that because those accounts were not randomly assigned. And so there may be differences in students um, that we're not capturing here, and we don't want to attribute it purely to the, the bank account ownership. If we move on to attitudes, which I said are really an important indicator of potential behaviors in the future, we also see positive effects. Here we've just highlighted two of the attitude questions. It's easy to save and banks are useful. And again, we've got in the gold, the treatment group that received the financial education, and in the blue, the control. And we see larger uh, increases, um, and frankly, the only increases if you look around the standard deviation band there, for the students who received the education. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about behavior. There are a couple of things that we can measure. And the first is just, do students have bank accounts? And we were very pleased to see, and again, it's difficult with a short sample period, right? We're only talking about maybe six weeks in each school year, um, and also a fairly small number of students. But we do see some increase in account ownership as a result of financial education. So when the students learn about the importance of saving and how to make a budget in school, they're more likely to go and open an account. Now, that is particularly, enc particularly encouraging because we know that there are other things that go along with having bank accounts that are positive. Building on that, if we look at the right-hand panel, we see that there's a big difference between students opening accounts if they have a bank in their school or a credit union branch in their school versus those who do not. So we see that really stark difference between the gold and the blue line there, which again indicates the importance of having these in-school branches. Students are much more likely to have accounts, and as I said, we know that there are positive things that come from that. So we thought that was a really important result. And again, as Laura mentioned, the $25 incentive that was given to students with Happy State Bank also increased um, take up of account ownership. Okay, so one more comment on behaviors. As you can see from looking at this graph, this is a pretty noisy measure. And, and as I already mentioned, the numbers are fairly small um, because here we're looking at only those students for whom we were able to obtain banking data. But we can see perhaps suggestive of a slight increase in net deposits around the financial education period, which is highlighted in blue. Um, but we want to be a little bit careful because given how noisy these measures are, it's really difficult to say with any certainty what's happening here. Um, but at least it's suggestive of maybe, uh, maybe some positive effects. Okay. Now again, I mentioned this early on, I think one of the most important things that we were able to document here in this study, which is distinct from most studies in this area, is the persistence of treatment effects. So we do have immediate pre and post testing, say six weeks or so apart during the year of the program, but those students in Eau Claire for the second year allowed us to really check a year later what has happened. And if you look at the left-hand panel, and I apologize, there are two that are in gold. The very top line is the quiz score, and then the line towards the middle is, is the question about banks useful to you. But you can see that from the first baseline to the first follow-up, we see substantial changes that then are maintained roughly one year later, which I think is really important evidence. Net deposits, on the other hand, as I mentioned, pretty noisy measure. And if we look at those three points before, immediately after, and long after, while we do see a slight increase immediately after the treatment, we see it fall back off. And so we need 
probably to do a little bit more to try to understand what's happening there. Okay, so just quickly to summarize our key findings, we found that even a brief educational intervention has a big impact on knowledge, and I think that is critical because we know how constrained teachers are, how many things they're trying to fit in their day, and so it's very encouraging to know that just a short intervention can have an impact. Um, being banked intensifies the effect. Again, banked students might be different, but there are lots of reasons to think that having banks in schools are a good thing that facilitates account ownership, um, which then has other positive effects. We saw impacts on attitudes about financial institutions, and account use proved a little bit difficult to measure, um, but we still feel that uh, we got some information that we can continue to mine, hopefully into the future, um, to see how kids are behaving when they have their own bank account. Now I'll turn it over to Casey to talk about the implications. Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> and we're really excited um, to finally get this research out to all of you. We think the findings are really exciting. Um, and again, we just want to talk briefly about some of the implications for policy and for practice that we took away from the study. Um, you know, and first, we think that this research provides positive evidence of the impact of financial education, um, even in just small doses on students' financial knowledge and capabilities. Um, we think these are really encouraging findings for proponents of classroom-based education. You know, however, we do really want to stress that training and support for teachers were really critical to the success of the APCO pilot. Um, and we think that schools, um, you know, school systems that are interested in replicating these type of findings would really need to be willing to invest the time and resources necessary to provide similar support to teachers. Um, we also think that this study provides evidence of how partnerships with other organizations in the community and financial institutions can be integrated into efforts to provide financial education in the classroom, um, you know, maybe as a way to pr help provide resources or support for teachers. And I think an example of that is in Eau Claire where, you know, RCU is actually in some cases helping to teach the lessons in some of the classrooms. Um, you know, we think that could be an example for other partnerships that schools or financial institutions could look to replicate. You know, and we also think these findings are really positive for in-school banking programs. You know, as Elizabeth just described, we saw direct impact from access to accounts in schools on students' attitudes and on whether or not students have accounts. And, you know, and again, we can't, the, our data doesn't speak specifically to whether having the account had an impact on students' learning because the students could be different. Um, you know, but again, it's sort of, it's clear that having access in school does help kids get into accounts. You know, and we also have that anecdotal evidence that Laura pointed out around, you know, teachers feeling like students that had accounts were more engaged in the lesson. So we think that these are really, um, this is a really exciting model, and we hope that others take this research, become more interested in it, and explore how they could do this in their community. Um, because we do know there is a lot of interest in serving this market, and we think there's a lot of interest both from schools and from financial institutions on how to make these types of programs work. You know, however, um, you know, we have found in our work that there's really need for guidance for, for financial institutions on how to help serve this marketplace. You know, for example, in Amarillo, and Laura talked about this, right, so we had to offer child-only accounts um, because Happy State Bank required paperwork or un identification that perhaps not all of the parents had. And we were able to work around that in Amarillo and find a solution for it. But I think there are many institutions that are trying to figure out how do we serve this? How do we open accounts for kids? You know, who's the signature on the, on the account? Sort of what kind of documentation on the identification of the account owner do we need? Um, and we think that more guidance um, and sort of guidelines for financial institutions and how to best do that will really help people meet the growing needs for these types of programs that are out there in the field. Um, so again, I think those are some of our big key takeaways from the program, and I want to turn it back over to Hallie to sort of get the questions from all of you on the research. Thank you, Casey. And we actually do have quite a few um, really great questions from the audience that have been rolling in. Um, the first one, actually, I'm going to direct 
towards you, Casey. Um, mm-hmm. And this one goes back to um, when you were describing the incentive. Um, I believe it was twenty-five dollars. And you did speak on um, some changes in um, take up of savings accounts. So the kids who did receive the incentive were more likely to open the savings accounts. Um, mm-hmm. Did you also see any changes in um, overall attitudes toward um, in the long term of the program? So not just with the take up of the account, but then with um, consistently adding to it or actually, um, you know, improvement in knowledge with those students who did who did receive the incentive? Laura and Elizabeth can maybe help me answer this one too, but I don't believe that we saw any impact on knowledge from the, the seed account or from the seed deposit itself. Um, and I also don't believe that there were sort of conclusive findings on whether getting that seed deposit had an impact on sort of account use over time. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly, Elizabeth or Laura? Um, this is Elizabeth. So the, the only thing that I recall specifically having looked at was whether or not, so when we looked at some of the deposit, net deposit behavior um, that everyone saw at the very end of my discussion, we saw that it was very noisy. And I think we mm-hmm. did drill down a little deeper into that to try to understand if um, what was going on in Eau Claire versus Amarillo, and if what was happening in Amarillo had anything to do with potential withdrawal of the seed money. And as I recall, we found that that was not the case. There were, in fact, differences between behavior in Amarillo and behavior in Eau Claire, but it was not the case that students who had received the $25 were withdrawing it. In fact, the students, again, if I remember correctly, it's all in the report, so I direct people to that, Students who had received the seed money were, in fact, more likely to keep the money in the account than students who just opened their own accounts. Um, but I think that's the only comment I can make on differences at this point. Yeah. Yeah, um, and and actually, there, the deposit activity in Amarillo, we found kind of a negative relationship between um, the student having... Uh, financial education and deposits and, you know, one kind of hypothesis was that students who received the seed deposit perhaps were not as actively using the account, that it incentivized them to open it, but we did not see any evidence of, I I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, more active um, account use of those students. Yeah, and again, as Elizabeth said, the full report does have sort of more information on all of this and sort of delves into all the different relationships, so really sort of direct people to, to look in there for further stuff or follow up with questions with us after the webinar as well, too, if we didn't answer anything. Okay, I'm going to, um, I'll pose another question that came through, um, and I think that I'll direct this towards um, Jennifer first and then um, I would say probably Laura. Um, to speak on both um, Amarillo and Eau Claire. Um, so one of the it, – it, it revolves around the goals um, that kids had in their savings. So were any of the kids saving for college? And if they were, were those successful? If they weren't, um, do you think that that type of long-term, kind of um, far-on-the-horizon type goal um, would have worked? Or were kids more focused on um, – um, closer type of, of savings goals. Absolutely. Um, in this, in these lessons, we talked about short-term goals and long-term goals, and the differences between those two. For the purposes of these lessons, we specifically asked the children to choose something that they could save for in one year's time. We wanted to work with them on the short-term goals, then help them look forward to see how they could come up with plans to serve long-term goals. So we talked about both, but the specific plan that we worked on with the kids in the lessons was short-term goals. And just to add to that, um, we I don't believe that there was a mention specifically around college, but I think it was short and long-term, so college potentially could have been a goal of the students. I think that there are other studies and pilots specifically looking at college, um, and I know in Texas that is something that we're particularly interested in and, and plan to kind of 
take these findings and build on them and exploring some pilots with accounts specifically um, dedicated for college. Um, great. So I have another question, and this revolves around the, um, the grade level that was chosen and um, being the fourth and fifth grades. Um, did, was it found to be that this is really the optimal grade level um, for introducing this type of education, or um, could an even um, earlier intervention or so um, earlier in, in students' education level be um, just as useful, or if not more so? And this will be directed towards, um, I would say, probably either Casey or actually um, Elizabeth is going to take this one, and then we'll throw it to Casey. Sure. Thanks. So um, I think as to whether or not this is optimal, um, that we don't know. Right. So we're too early in the process. There haven't been enough rigorous studies done and, and longitudinal studies to really know if this is um, an optimal age. What I can say is that this age group has advantages. Um, they are still young, so they're really informative years, but they for the most part are able to read, are able to articulate their thoughts clearly, are able to understand some of the concepts that go along with this. But I will say um, there's absolutely evidence that developmentally kids are able to start understanding these concepts well before fourth and fifth grade. And so I think there's absolutely room for interventions, even frankly as early as preschool. Um, and there are some references cited, I believe in the report, that talk about those developmental stages and the fact that, as I said, even as early as preschool children, we can start teaching uh, about, about money management and about delaying gratification and some of the foundational concepts. Casey, did you have anything to add? No, I think the only thing I would add is just I think for this study in particular, I don't think we went into it targeting sort of the fourth or fifth grade. I think it was, you know, I think initially we were interested in perhaps in going into even a middle school um, I think it sort of is a combination of the sites that we found that sort of would work for the pilot. Um, again, we were interested in going younger than high school, but not, I don't believe, targeting a very specific age when you're first looking for the pilot. Um, I have another question that is going to be directed to Jennifer. It, it has showed up a couple times from the audience, and so this revolves around the resources that it takes to open the in-school branch, whether um, that is expensive on the part of the um, banking institution, and how does that um, how does how is that justified for the investment that it takes for a um, bank to actually um, open that branch, and also so kind of a two-parter, um, what type of resources or um, how burdensome, I guess, could this be on a school who is who is looking to open up an in-school branch? Well, that's a great question. First, let me address the resources it takes to run um, these types of programs. And there is a lot of resources needed. You need staff. You need materials. Um, all the computers we take um, out into the field and into the schools. And it is a commitment that... The credit union that I work for and the credit union industry as a whole has made people helping people. So we carve out a part of our public relations budget to uh, run and maintain this program. Um, as far as a school opening, how burdensome is it on them? Um, you know, we really come in. We've got a great format for this. We come in and we do it. I will say that we are not out knocking on doors of schools asking them to open this program. We have a great reputation, but we found that the best partnerships we have are the schools that somehow have someone inside that school, maybe it's the principal, maybe it's the teacher, maybe it's the parent, who really wants our program to come into the school, and then we have an advocate. So we have people call us. A principal calls me and says, hey, Jen, I'm interested in learning more about the program. Um, myself or one of uh, the team members will go out and meet with the principal and just say, you know, are you willing to let us put up signs about what day uh, the kids can save at school? Are you willing to let us uh, let the kids do um, overhead announcements reminding uh, the student savers to bring their pouches in? So we really don't ask a lot of the school, um, but just for their partnership and to help us get 
the word out. Thank you. Um, did, Laura, did you have anything to add? Um, well, in terms of the bank branch, I would just say for this study, um, happy in the schools, there wasn't tremendous cost besides, you know, staff time. And what, the way they staff the 15 additional bank branches is they assign employees from branches closest to the school to go one time a week. Um, a way to kind of reduce costs is um, instead of having a, a bank day once a week, like Happy does, they or for the study was the case, um, they only have their bank day uh, two every two or three weeks. And you know, some institutions may just have a bank day once a month or less frequently than that. I think staff time is one of the the biggest expenses and resources required. Um, and I think that the bank can make it as Jennifer was saying, easy on the school by providing a lot of materials for the school and, and um, kind of a list of, of how they implement the program so that the school can just hang their posters and, and really implement the program for the bank but not really have to create anything themselves. And I have a question that I think I'll direct towards Casey, um, but Casey, feel free to um, throw it to any of your um, of the other presenters. Um, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about the parents and guardians' involvements uh, in the program, and basically whether it kind of maybe spurred um, parents wanting more information for their own personal banking or finance questions, so maybe whether it had some um, effects on. Um, parents reaching out. Sure. So again, I think the parents were involved in this study primarily in um, getting consent for their students to participate in the school. And I think in both Eau Claire and Amarillo, we did a lot of um, sort of attempts to sort of get parents to, one, be aware of the program so that they would consent for their kids to participate, but also just be excited about it. So there was local press in Amarillo and and in Eau Claire. And if you actually go to the site that Laura mentioned before that we're actually going to have a link up in a minute, like you can see some um, local news coverage that we got of the launch of the program in Amarillo. Um, I think there were sort of efforts on the school's part to send out brochures. Um, you know, in both cases there was a website that parents could visit to sort of look up information. So a lot of our efforts were really around awareness and not providing program for the parents, which I think could be, I think it's a great opportunity to do that. It, it was sort of outside of the scope that we could do in our pilot. Um, but I'll also turn it over to Jennifer and to Laura if they have any sort of maybe anecdotal information on if there are parents who sort of use this opportunity to try to find more information or learn about stuff with the kids. This is Jennifer. I can't specifically recall um, any parents contacting us for additional information um, as a result of this study. I will tell you that just as a part of our normal practice, uh, we try to attend events where the parents are to raise interest in the program. So we'll go to family night or parent-teacher conferences to let parents know about the Save at School program and certainly would be there to answer any questions they have about their own personal financial issues. We have qualified team members who go out and do that. Um, and we do also sponsor events like Family Math Nights, which encourage, encourages um, families working on different uh, financial games and types of things together. So those are a couple things we do to try to, to pull the parents in and certainly if they wanted to take the next step and ask us for more questions about personal financial issues, we'd be happy to, to help them. And the only thing I would add I mentioned in my presentation was that anecdotally we heard um, from one principal that some parents really found it to be an opportunity to experience the bank with their child when the bank day, bank time was after school, that they, some of them would actually line up with their student and make the deposit with them. We didn't hear if that then led them to also open a savings account themselves, but we heard the principal said she thought that the parents were taking advantage of this opportunity for their students and that they likely themselves didn't have a savings account, but we don't know, you know, if later on they 
this inspired them or prompted them to think about saving themselves. We just didn't capture that information. But we do have, you know, just a little bit of anecdotal evidence to suggest that parents were engaged in the program, at least in one school. Great. Um, thank you so much. So I, we're right on schedule, so I think with that we'll um, close the presentation. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone um, listening, all the audience members, realize, realize that we do have resources available. Um, so the full report and briefs are available at the links, um, and there are some other materials available as well on the resource link. Um, we will be posting the PowerPoint presentation um, on both the CFS and the CFED websites, which are listed right here um, on this last slide. Um, and the archived presentation will be available as well. Um, I just would really like to thank um, Louisa Quitman, Casey Weedrich, Jennifer McHugh, Laura Rosen and Elizabeth Otters White for their excellent presentations and insights on the topic today. And thank you to all the audience members who did tune in to listen. Um, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me and I can disperse those to the, present, the presenters today that we had. So thank you. Have a nice day.